Hello, and welcome to the video for what is predict projectile path. Let me jump into our example here. If I hit play and I click a button, we see a bunch of green spheres drop down with a little red sphere at the bottom. And then they'll disappear after a few seconds. Basically, what this node does, and there's actually three of them, we're going to cover all three of them, is it allows you to project a projectile's path using options such as its velocity, where it comes from, different tracing channels, and gravity, and give you a determined path so you can see if maybe there's a collision. And you can simulate this beforehand, so it's useful for things like bullets with drop and things like that. So let's look at the nodes themselves and how we use them. These are the nodes by default. We have a project, predict projectile path by trace channel, predict projectile path by object type, and then our predict projectile path advanced node. They're pretty much the same. The difference is this one goes by a trace channel for the collision check. This one goes by the object channel for the collision check. And this one allows you to actually use both of them at the same time and gives you more results, more detailed results. But enough of that. Let's go ahead and look at them and see how they work. Now, by default, if you hooked in the node, we're going to end up with this over here. And I hooked up a little thing so we can see where it's firing from. First thing is our start position. Where is it starting from? In this case, I'm just grabbing my actor's location. So it's going to come from the torso or the middle part of my character. Launch velocity is, well, the velocity at which it fires out. And you have an X, a Y, and a Z. To start off with, I'm going to give it a 400X. That way it's going to fire off forward and we're going to be able to see it. Now if I hit play... We'll actually see a little bit better result. You can see a little bit of an arc. Fires out from where the player is, goes down, and then it stops where the little red part's at. Now the red part is indicating where it's hitting or colliding, and that's indicated by this trace path option. If this is off, it's actually not going to do any traces for collisions and just give you the path. So if we go over here off the edge and fire, you can see it going down until it ends. It doesn't collide with anything because we don't have the trace path option off. And if we were to actually play again and we look, you'll notice in the top left it says false. Let me go ahead and get rid of these lighting errors because our light is not set to dynamic. There we go. So now they'll be gone. You'll notice it says false in the top left. I'll do it a couple times. That's because I'm checking to see if we're hitting anything. And with this disabled, we're not. Turn it back on. And we'll fire off nicely true. By default, it comes enabled, but if you don't want to, you just actually want to see where something's going and maybe use another method of seeing what it hits, you'd want that option. Projectile radius. Well, how large or how far around is our projectile? By default, it's zero, and you're probably not going to get too good of a result out of that one. As you can see here, it does work. It does have a minimum, but something a little more realistic to be your actual projectile itself is probably recommended seems to default to somewhere around 3. You can, of course, go much larger. If you have something bigger, you can see here is our 100. And you can see it's pretty much hitting a true based on where it's firing off because of the ground, of how large it is. You can see that right there. Okay, we'll put that back to something like 10 because I like to 10. Now, using the trace channel predict projectile path node, we have the trace channel as our option. If we're using object type, it'll have object type as our option. And this determines what it's going to hit against. If you don't know much about collisions, go ahead and check out the videos about collisions. But basically, this is our visibility channel I'm checking against. You have all your other channels you can use. If we were to go into our project settings, and we go into our trace settings. Uh, collision. Boop. There we go. We have our object channels and our trace channels. By default, we have some presets for the trace channels and the object channels. And I'm using visibility as my trace channel. Trace complex, whether or not it's going to check trace against triangles or primitives. By default, it's going to trace against the primitives. So like a circle, uh, primitive, circle sphere, your collision item on your item. Collision item on your whatever you're tracing against. If you turn on trace complex, it's going to take a little bit more processing power. You'll find it's off by default. But it's going to trace against the triangles itself and not the primitive collision. So depending on if you're using complex or not in your mesh, you may have to enable this. Actors to ignore. By default, this is going to be off. And if we were to fire this off right now, you're going to find 
we might end up with a weird result. Now, we might end up with a weird result because we're not ignoring the player. This is if you want to ignore something specific. Maybe you only want this to affect the environment, and you have all of your environment flagged as a certain visibility channel. You would go ahead and make an array to ignore whatever you don't want. These are debug options. It's pretty simple. It's standard. How long do you want to debug for and what type of debug? And that's why we can see our green spheres when we run this. Now, these are the main options to determine how it's going to simulate. Sim frequency and max sim, tide, sim time are tied together. Basically, how long will it simulate for? So in this case, two seconds. And how often per second is it going to simulate and check for collisions? This time, it's 15. I can show you exactly how this works by doing something really simple. Let's simulate for one second. And let's simulate two times. We'll go ahead and hit play. And we'll run this, and you'll now see basically nothing. It's because we're hitting the end result too soon. If we go over here and we hit play, you'll see we have two cubes. It simulated over one second two times. It checked two times within one second along our path. And, of course, if we do increase this to something like, let's go five, make it easier to see, you'll notice we now will simulate five times. And you'll see we have five extra spheres not counting the first one because that's where we started at. Basically, how many times you want to check, the more times, the more computationally expensive it is. It's still relatively cheap. But basically, how often do you want to check, and then how long or how far do you want to go in terms of the total sim time? Gravity is our last option. By default, it uses the world gravity, which is negative 980, meant to simulate Earth. You can change this to whatever you want. For example, if I change this to 1, we're going to see a pretty straight projectile path, and that's because one is a small amount up. It's barely anything, so it's going to shoot straight. And this is useful if you want to, you know, check something that has a low droop, for example, or something that you don't really want to check um, how much gravity affects it. You just want to say, hey, I want to fire this forward. Let's see if we hit anything on the certain channels. Now, you notice here I have a collision, and here I don't because I've disabled the visibility channel on that object. If we were to check the object and go down to our collision, you notice visibility is set to ignore. So even though we can see it, the trace check is ignoring visibility. We go down to our other option here. Well, actually, sorry. Let's actually check our outputs. That's kind of important. So our outputs are going to be a hit output. This is just our normal hit result. If we look at it, we can see, based on whatever we hit, all of our normal hit options. If you haven't seen this before, check out what the hit result is is in terms of its own video, but we can see where it hit, what it hit, when it hit it, et cetera, et cetera. The things that are unique to this node are going to be our path positions and our last trace destination. Now, these things are kind of interesting. Path positions, I'm going to go ahead and put a break here so we can show you. We'll compile and play, and we'll run this. We'll go ahead and hit something. It debugged, and we'll go ahead and look at what we hit. Now, if we check this out, we did hit something. And our out hit is going to be a structure that's going to be what we hit. Our path positions are going to be all of our trace positions. So it's going to go from the beginning to the end. And the last one is going to be if we hit something. So in this case, if you look at number five, that is the location of where we hit something, our impact point. You'll notice we have 180, 248, and 118. If we check this out, this is our last trace destination, you'll notice it's different. It's 216. 248. If you look at our numbers, our last two aren't going to matter much. Those are our Y and our Z. We're not moving forward. We're going on our X. You'll notice the last one here, our impact point is 180. And you'll notice here, 216, which is actually after the point. And it tells you this. It tells you the last trace destination will not necessarily be the last point or the hit point if there's a hit. It continues to trace out from your start point to your end point, which is right here. And this will simply contain every point in between, but it will stop at a hit. So that's kind of important to note. If we were to get closer to this, and we were to fire it off, and we look and see what we have, you'll notice we now have much smaller amount of path positions because we didn't go very far until we actually hit something. So that is kind of the key here. Your path positions are your path positions from your start to your hit point. Your last 
trace destination is your last point on the trace, it does not necessarily mean it's your hit unless your last position is your hit, which is going to be very rare. If we uncheck, uncheck trace path and we hit play, now you'll notice when we check this, our last position, 246, 233, 118. Our last one here, 246. We never hit anything, therefore we never had an impact, therefore our last trace is going to match our last path position. So those are the pieces of information if you want to check everything out. Let's undebug this. Let's go ahead and trace path again. And we'll go ahead and show you. So all of those path positions are these little individual spears from our start, each part, all the way to our end point, or if we're hitting something, our last impact point. So if you wanted to maybe draw them out for the player, maybe, for example, you wanted to draw an arc and you didn't want to use the debug, you can use our path positions to draw from one point to the other to show them the arc of their shot or wherever they're aiming. It's useful if you kind of have ever played a game where you can actually see the arc in real time. You could simply do this check and draw out things to indicate based on your arc. Now, if we were to look at the path by object type, the only difference here is we're filtering by our object type, not our visibility channel. Again, check out the collision videos. But in this case, world static could be one of the options, world dynamic, whatever you want. Everything else is going to be the same. This one just simply filters by the object collision channel, not the trace collision channel. The last one's a little more complicated. We'll pull it down here. We'll go ahead and take a look at it. And you'll notice, unfortunately, everything's in a different order, which is super annoying. But we actually have both the trace channel and the object types. We can use both of them or one of them. By default, you have trace with channel as a check or an uncheck. So we can actually enable or disable this. If it's disabled, then it will not trace by the channel. If it's enabled, it will trace by the channel. And then our object types itself, well, actually, if we unhook this and we go to compile, we get an error because object types is required. So you can kind of think of this as the project, predict projectile path by object type with the optional trace by channel. Now we've got this set up, and let's say we're going to go ahead and run this. And you can look and see, we'll go ahead and, well, let's change our gravity to 1. That way we can fire forward. We'll go ahead and fire forward, and you'll see it hits that. You'll see it hits that. We have visibility. Remember before, we were not able to hit that cone with visibility trace, as we can see up here, because I had it disabled. However, I'm also checking against the world dynamic object type. And if we check that item, world dynamic object response is set to block. So that's why we're able to hit that. This one's useful if you want to have maybe some object collision and then a visibility. So, for example, maybe only hit enemy players. However, don't trace against the visibility. You want it so you only trace them if they're not visible, for example. So if they're hidden, you don't want to hit them. But if they're not hidden and they're enemies, you want to hit them. Biggest difference on this one is you have a much different output. By default, we just have a predict projectile path params option. You can see here. If we break that apart, we get this one. It turns into predict result and a return value. And we can do that simply by breaking. And we get this output right here. Whoops, that is... Uh, do, do, do. Oh, duh. Nah, never mind. Sorry. I went backwards. I went st one step ahead. Okay. So our node itself is the predict projectile path advanced here. You actually have to make the params, which is this struct right here. And the output is this one right here. So for example, we were to break this apart, we get this. This contains an array of path data, which is basically our output path positions. But in addition to the location, we also get the velocity and the time for that individual hit. Same thing with the last trace destination. Instead of just the vector or our last destination, we get the location and the velocity and then the time. And then like normal, we get our hit result, which you can see here. Basically, the advanced one not only gives us the location of each of the pieces of information, it will also give us the velocity for that piece and the time, as well as the ability to have a trace and an object channel.
I know this video was a little long for something pretty simple, but it's nice and useful. Hopefully it covered all the information you needed. These nodes are useful if you want to project, predict a projectile path using gravity. That's kind of the biggest difference between this and a trace. A trace will file out, fire out in one direction normally, whereas this predict projectile path node will fire out using gravity to determine you know, the path and the different points. So it's useful for something you could think of like an Angry Birds type game, or even if it's a first person shooter and you want the guns to kind of react realistically and you have bullet droop. One thing that's nice and simple, just a quick little thing here. If we were to take our actor rotation, grab his forward vector and then multiply it and put that into the launch velocity, it makes it really simple. Whoops, I actually got to plug in our left click node here to basically fire forward from whichever direction the player is facing, as you can see here, because I'm putting that into the vector. I figured I'd just throw that in in case someone was wondering how easy it was to do it. There we go. Now I'm firing forward and predicting forward. That's it. That's going to wrap up our predict projectile path nodes.